Last subject of today is on uh, woke corporatism. So this is something that I think is really important uh, and has been pushed to the forefront recently because of a lot of the social issues that have been going on in the United States, uh, both with COVID and without co- and outside of COVID. Um, but specifically, I'm going to focus on, because it's the more, re- more uh, you know, relevant one right now, is uh, a lot of the Black Lives Matter uh, stuff. So, and, and regardless of which side of the issue you're on, I think you'll be able to see eye to eye with me on, uh, something within this. So don't, uh, don't run away. But, uh, basically what is woke corporatism or what am I defining it as? So it's essentially where companies in response to social issues, you know, make ads around them and you essentially are socially posturing. So The classic example is uh, Kylie Jenner in the Pepsi commercial um, or like the Gillette ad a couple years ago uh, talking about um, toxic masculinity. And I think it's really important because while those are, of course, issues that uh, I do think are important for the social, um, you know, discourse, uh, we have to keep in mind that we shouldn't be getting like we shouldn't be getting. And right now it's uh, right now it's, you know, the NBA, the NFL, um, you know, (laughs) where NBA players are doing, you know, a protest of say, uh, police brutality by, you know, doing not, you know, by not, by doing a walkout, basically a strike. Um, and then the NBA and the NFL capitalizing on this by saying that, you know, they support, you know, Black Lives Matter or they support this, you know, specific athlete that stood up in this way. Um, and I think that, whether you're, regardless of which side of the issue you're on, I think that a lot of people find that very disingenuous because it is. Um, I think that it's important for individual employees, athletes, you know, people uh, to stand up for things that they believe in and to be able to do that without, retro, you know, without retribution from their company and retaliation. Um, but I think it's important for us to remember that, like, pri- that private companies don't you know, their, their motive is profit. They don't have moral values and we shouldn't be deriving, you know, morality from them. Um, I think that oftentimes they are, you know, we center our lives around our job, whether it's like, you know, getting valuation, like getting personal validation from working for a specific company that people know of, or, you know, looking at it, say, well, Starbucks, uh, didn't, you know, put, put, like Christmas on the cup. So I don't want to go there because they're anti Christmas. They don't care about Christmas. They don't care about happy holidays. That's not what it's about. They care about what is going to make people want to come there and whatever is going to make more people come there and make them more money is what they're going to do. And we need to all keep this in mind because this is reality. Um, and whether we are on one side of, you know, a specific social issue or the other, We shouldn't let companies divide us on that because they don't really care. Um, They're chasing profits. This serves only one thing, in my opinion, and that's to make people feel good. You know, you look at it from the perspective of like, oh, company A agrees with me because they support this issue. Therefore, I'm going to go there. It's, It's not real. Now, I will say if you're in, say, an area where you have a lot of you know, smaller businesses that are either like family owned or, you know, locally owned. I think that in those scenarios that, yeah, if they're treating workers in a way that is really, you know, that is beneficial, if they're good for the community, if they make a good product or service, then yes, we should support those. But I'm speaking specifically on say corporations like, uh, like Starbucks and don't get me wrong. I love, um, uh, what is it? I love their, I love their, their drinks. The, uh, like I love their caramel cloud macchiato, but I also don't go there because I think that they are socially progressive. I think that when you look at a company like that, that is oftentimes trying to posture as though they are socially progressive. And then you see stuff come out about how, you know, they aren't like they're paying employees less, um, like the minority employees less within their airport locations because their airport locations are not, um, or they are rather they are uh, franchised. So they don't have the same restrictions as Starbucks corporate. I think it's important to look at the merits of what those companies are actually doing for workers and, you know, 
whether it's minorities, like when, you know, POCs, women, uh, sexual orientation, regardless, I think it's important to look at the merits of what they're doing and to look more at individual actions instead of just being happy they're on our team or not. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I, and like I said, I do think that individual employees and athletes can and should make a difference, uh, and without retaliation, um, good examples of this. I know right now is, you know, Kaepernick is what people are, uh, you know, aware of, but I, I, I get that that's a polarizing figure currently, but ones that if you want good examples, uh, throughout history to look at are, uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith from the 1968 Olympics and the, uh, 200 meter, uh, re four by 200 meter relay final. Um, it's a really good, it's a really good, uh, example. Uh, definitely look it up and read up on it. But basically the idea was that, um, in 1968 in the Mexico city Olympics, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, who are both two, uh, two black, uh, sprinters from the United States <clears throat> finished, uh, first and third. And they decided to protest during the U.S. national anthem by holding up, uh, you know, a fist with a black glove on each of their hands. And um, and like I said, they were the first and third fastest person at 200 meters in the world. Um, and they ended up getting ostracized and never allowed to compete for the United States again um, because of that. Uh, protest. And so did the white man from Australia, the sprinter that got the silver, um, because he joined in by giving them, he was the one that gave them his gloves for them to protest. And he also was not allowed by the Olympic, uh, by the IOC um, to compete again. And I think it's really important to remember this because we always, you know, in the moment we react to a specific, you know, figure or situation or posturing and like, you know, Kaepernick or Nike or companies doing this, but I think it's really important to look historically at the merits and realize that, you know, people who stand up for, um, issues in society always do get ostracized at the time, but end up getting, uh, more embraced later on. Um, but the point is people, not the companies. That's the key part. <clears throat> Another great example. One moment. Another great example of this is, of course, Muhammad Ali. You know, Ali, uh, if you are if you have a parent, my dad was in the Marine Corps for 22 years. If you have a parent who is, you know, very pro-military or was in the military <clears throat> during the 19, you know, 60s to 1990s, um, so during that, around that Vietnam period, oftentimes they will still have issues with Ali to this day, even though a lot of us, you know, if you grew up like I did in the late 1990s and early 2000s, you know, you probably have a pretty positive view of Ali. But back then, people didn't because they felt that he was, you know, a draft dodger, that he was not doing, you know, not serving his country. And he was just looking for an easy way out by saying that he, you know, was not a, um, you know, that he was Muslim. Therefore, he was not a proponent of the, um, you know, the war that was going on in Vietnam because of violence. But they always leave out that he didn't that that wasn't really his his gripe his gripe was that he felt that he was he is a you know Ameri a black american was not uh was not represented and he didn't feel that he should put his life on the line for a country where he was still called slurs in public and um if you if you actually look up the interview from where he initially uh, stated as a conscientious objector. That is literally what he says uh, in much more colorful language that I will, uh, you know, refrain from. But um, yeah, it's really important to keep in mind because people think, you know, they look, they'll, they'll talk about it and say like, oh, he, he took the easy way out and this and that. It's like he literally lost three years of his career in his prime, his peak earning years because of that. You know, that's, something that we need to keep in mind because we shouldn't villainize individuals for standing up for what, you know, they feel that they deserve, what they are willing to work for, what they, you know, the respect that they feel they deserve. Um, we should, you know, we should always look at the institution that causes that and make sure that we don't fall prey to whatever narrative that it is presenting. 
<clears throat> and instead listen to the individual people. And so I think that it's important, like I said, that we, um, that we don't look to companies as moral compass. We realize what they are. They're looking for a way to, you know, make money, extract resources, and provide products. They are not, you know, they're not our friends. Um, we can work for good companies, don't get me wrong, but it's the people that make up that company. Uh, and I think it's also really important to keep in mind that companies use these types of things. I know there was a lot of controversy around uh, White Fragility, the book that came out, um, and how controversy on both sides, uh, both the right and the left of the American political spectrum specifically, where the right looked at it as this is, uh, you know, virtue signaling. This is a way of, um, you know, quote unquote, atoning for past sins. And some on, and a lot of people on the left also looked at it as this is not productive. This is just, uh, essentially like HR departments trying to find ways to, get, um, you know, to have more programs so they have more plausible deniability in the case of a lawsuit about discrimination. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind that we have to remember that, um, you know, we should be working on stuff together. Polarizing things like this uh, are not helpful. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, because I think that the problem is that it ends up making it so that those companies are then able to essentially scapegoat people um and not take responsibility for like i said earlier about starbucks you know these companies are a lot of the time responsible for the systemic reasons that you know these social issues occur like if a, you know if companies are essentially putting a squeeze on an economic squeeze on people by paying people less and forcing them to work in worse conditions because it makes them more money um, I don't really care what their HR policy is on, um, you know, systemic racism. They need to do something, you know, I, I want to see what their actions are. And I feel like that's something that we as, you know, a country um, and worldwide should be able to agree on that that's not helpful. That talking to individual people and treating people as people um, while trying to reform the systems that you know, deal the outcomes that those people are dealing with. And because of this, I think that's generally a counterproductive thing because, uh, you know, people on the right definitely are, have a, have a point in being upset with the, um, you know, with this, because it seems as vapid social posturing, uh, while ignoring the, ignoring the root of the problem. And I think it makes it too, it makes it easier for people that already, um, you know, or, uh, you know, think there isn't an issue, it makes it easier for them to say, look, this is just, you know, empty, this is virtue signaling, and it just causes nothing to get done. Um, that being said, I think for, you know, us as like individuals, I think that <clears throat> it's important for us to, in, to raise awareness. And I think that's really effective. And I think the best way to do that, you know, is grassroots organically talking to people that we work with talking to people that we know um you know about their life experience about our life experience and uh, i definitely want to do that in the future and that's part of the reason that i changed the name um <clears throat> from engineering success because i it's a wealth for 99 because i think that um that was the ultimate goal of the channel anyway uh is to talk more to the average person and talk about how to financial plan and build wealth for the average person. <clears throat> and I think that's a much more, uh, a much, a much better, you know, name and, uh, name for it. And that's what I want to do. And in the future, I definitely want to talk to more people. And that's the goal of this is going to be as I get more of a platform is to get more people on and to talk about their life experiences and talk about how, you know, financially what they're doing what problems they deal with so that we have a better idea of, you know, what's going on outside of our bubble. Um, and so, <clears throat> like I said, on this issue, I think people on both sides say, uh, you know, of the BLM argument, hate woke advertising. Um, and I think we need to call it out to effectuate real change. And I'll also put a really good um, link in the description from Coffee Break. If you want a great video, um, like video essay style, uh, with really good, um, visuals from a year ago, 
Coffee Break is a YouTube channel who did one on woke advertising, and it is uh, phenomenal. So I will put that link in the description box below. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, that's that's for woke corporatism. I'm not a fan. Uh, I don't think anyone is. So except for the corporations themselves. And if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and check out the full live version of the Wealth for 99 podcast, where we talk finance, economics, and public policy from a working class perspective. We'll see you there.